Indridi Indridasa. Indridi Indridasa, October the 12th, 1883 to August the 31st, 1912, was an Icelandic trance medium, one of the first such gifted people in Iceland to have their abilities documented and researched. But to understand Indridi, it may help to first know something about Iceland itself, its landscape, culture and the living conditions in the early 1900s as they played a significant part in his abilities. Iceland Iceland lies in the North Atlantic Ocean just outside the Arctic Circle. During winter the island has only four to five hours of daylight. In summer, from May through July, the sun doesn't set, but this is the busiest time for farmers and fishermen. The island is cold and wet, although the Gulf Stream has a moderating effect. Clouds cover the sky most days, and low mists drift through the valleys. According to the ancient manuscript, Landa Marbok, the settlement of Iceland began in 874 AD by the Norwegian chieftain Ingolfa Arnason. But the closest bodies of land to Iceland are the Faroe Islands, Shetland, the Outer Hebrides, the Scottish mainland and Orkney. Norway is actually further away. Nevertheless, in the following centuries, more Norwegians, other Scandinavians and people of Gaelic origin all immigrated to Iceland. Initially, the Norwegians set about raising the woods and forests of the island, using the wood as fuel and building material. But Iceland is not a land of vast forests. By the time Indridi was born, Icelanders were importing coal and kerosene for lighting and heating, although much use was still made of traditional national peat in cooking. So although today Iceland's electricity production comes from hydropower, geothermal energy for electricity generation and for heating, especially district heating. Indridi grew up in a home using peat or coal and kerosene lamps. What did his family do? Indridi was raised on a remote farm and was uneducated, although he could read and write. Until the 20th century, Iceland relied largely on subsistence fishing, agriculture and whaling, which supplied meat and blubber for cooking. Birds such as ducks, gulls and puffins were also captured and eaten. And when there was daylight, everyone was needed to work. Haymaking, milking, peat cutting, fishing and fish processing. And when it was dark, everyone sat round and retold stories or sang songs. Iceland had a strong oral tradition, stemming from the pre-Christian inhabitants of the island, and texts include the Prose Edda and the Poetic Edda. The Poetic Edda consists almost entirely of poems. This is the land of the thunder god Thor, and of Odin and the goddess Freya, 
of the nine worlds that flank the central sacred tree, Idrisel, and the events of Ragnarok, when the world is enveloped in flames, only to be reborn anew. Although Indridi may not have been able to get to a school, he may have had some exposure to the church, and this little church is an example of where he might have gone. Lutheranism was the dominant religion, and through the church he may also have discovered music through the harmonium. But the church did not extinguish the myths and deities, the stories and the supernatural. They simply added to them, with vast layers of saints and miracles. So just an addition, not a replacement. And finally, to add further to Indridi's influences, we must never forget the landscape. Iceland, the land of the supernatural. The boundary between the North American and Eurasian tectonic plates runs through Iceland. It is possible to walk along the rift that marks the boundary. Iceland's Pingvella is on this boundary. It was the site of the Alfing the annual parliament of Iceland from the year 930 until 1798. But this position means the island is extremely active volcanically. There are geysers, bubbling springs and erupting volcanoes in action all the time. The whole landscape speaks of the supernatural. Much of Iceland is covered by vast black lava fields, with lava twisted into strange, troll-like shapes. There are areas of sandy ground, gushing steam and hot water. These days, this very active geothermal activity is harnessed to heat homes, but in former days it was the subject of myths. Geysers suddenly shoot unpredictably hundreds of feet high, then just as unpredictably subside to a small bubbling pool. There are impenetrable mountains, most covered by snow and glaciers. Indeed, in the south of the country, glaciers flow down from Vatna Yokel, Myrads Yokel, almost to the sea. Large lakes fill many of the valleys, meaning that houses can only be built on the lower slopes of the mountains, above the sea and lakes. Furthermore, only about a quarter of the country has vegetation, and yet in spring, apparently from nowhere, beautiful, fragile-looking flowers begin to appear from nowhere. And the island is actually full of life in the form of birds, nesting birds, visiting birds and flying birds, puffins making their homes on cliffs. Ducks dabbling about with chicks, wading birds of every kind, gulls and terns swooping and diving. There are waterfalls of tremendous size, terrifying in their power and ferocity. It is a land where their horses have long flowing manes and tails in blonde and gold. It is a land where one volcanic eruption can melt enough water to wipe out an entire valley and its inhabitants. Even today the roads around the island are mostly unpaved because they are always having to be remade. It is a land where the water is either a strange pale blue or it looks like milk and is hot. 
because it is being heated by lava. It is a land of life and death and magic. In Reedy and Psychokinesis, the table tilting. When he was 22, Indridi moved to Reykjavik to work for a newspaper as a printer's apprentice. He was given lodgings by a relative. But early in 1905, Indridi was invited to join a spiritualist's meeting by his relative's wife, and he had barely sat down when the table at which the group sat moved violently. Indridi, however, became afraid saying he wished to leave. Nevertheless, the experimental society was formalised in autumn 1905 in order to investigate Indridi. Its president was Ina Kavaran, a novelist, poet and prominent spiritualist. Kavaran, the son of Reverend Hjörleifer Einarsson, played a major part in the investigation and in the publicising of many Icelandic mediums, not just Indridi Indridison. The society built an experimental house for Indridi to provide maximally controlled conditions for observing him, and he lived there with a theology student. It also paid him a living allowance. We have 30 examples of Indridi's abilities on our website, allabouthappen.org, all originally recorded in the Proceedings of the Society for Psychical Research, Volume 57. And here we have a summary of just some of them. Automatic Writing Indridi found he was able to produce automatic writing immediately he tried it when he was in a conscious state, but it was not long before a spirit control appeared. When Indridi made a joke about this control, she ordered him to fall into a trance, and he did. From that point on, all Indridi's actions were done in a deep trance. Ina Kavaran 1906. He wrote a few sentences with harsh jerks and sighed heavily and screamed from time to time. He spoke with someone he thought as being with him, asked him not to treat him badly. After about an hour he was woken up, apparently by the same force that had put him to sleep. He was woken at our request, as we had not seen this state before and were uneasy. Out of Body Indridi, in this same deep trance state, started to speak with great astonishment about his own body, as if his conscious self was out of the body, but viewing it from some other angle. Heralda Nielsen was an active member of the Spiritualist Society of Iceland and the nephew of the Bishop of Iceland. He reported that Indridi said, Oh, see me and me. You are there below with the body. The body is not me. I am up here. There are two Indridis. The lips of the body move and they say what I say. Table Lifting Psychokinesis By November, a control arrived who said he was Conrad Gislas' son, the brother of Indridi's grandfather. He was to remain Indridi's principal control for the rest of his mediumistic experiences. During this time, tables moved across the floor, levitated, were snatched away and landed on other tables. Knocks and Raps 
Wikipedia. Physical mediumship is defined as manipulation of energies and energy systems by spirits. This type of mediumship is claimed to involve perceptible manifestations such as loud raps and noises. The medium is used as a source of power for such spirit manifestations. The knocks and raps produced by Indridi came from the walls and even the ceiling 10 feet from the floor. Meanwhile, according to Nielsen, Indridi was in a trance so deep his heart seemed to have stopped beating and his pulse was so weak that it could hardly be detected. And meanwhile, the strokes roared on the panels round him. Lights and Materializations Many self-luminous lights, spots in the air or on the walls, round or oblong, white or red, or of different colours, appeared. They were generally accompanied by strong gusts of wind that flapped the pages of notebooks and ruffled people's hair. Just before the clearest lights appeared, Indridi was heard to groan painfully. The lights continued until for two days in December there appeared the figure of a man from within those lights who was unknown to those present. Ina Kavarin, 1906 The medium was some eight to ten feet from the place where we saw the man standing. Entreaty began to shriek and scream when the lights were coming. They seemed to cause him much pain. The lights came in bursts, with small pauses in between, and during the pauses the medium was calm. It is worth noting that in December in Iceland there is only four hours of daylight from around 12 to 4 p.m. Furthermore, electricity did not appear in houses until the 1920s. Flying Indridi was also flown across the room by his spirit controls although this thankfully appears to have not caused him any pain. Heralda Nielsen We placed Indridi in a basket chair, which creaked conveniently upon the least movement. We placed this at one end of the room, and tight rows of chairs all across the room, so that any passage between the chairs was made impossible. Then the sitters, some fifty or more in number, sat down on all the chairs and the light was put out. Very soon the medium was levitated in the basket chair a great distance from the floor, the creaking in the chair being heard while it glided, containing the medium above our heads and was eventually rather noisily deposited on the floor behind the chairs. Then the light was immediately lit and there sat the medium in a deep trance in the chair in which he seemed to have been sitting immovable during this trip. Levitation Kavaran reported that Indridi was sometimes levitated bodily with no support and had also been levitated whilst lying on a sofa. Aina Kavaran 1906. We were allowed to light a match, and we all saw him in the position, with nothing else holding him off the floor. As we put out the match, he fell down on the floor, overturning the living room table as he fell. The medium complained about the treatment. Sometimes during levitation, he bumped his head harshly against the ceiling and complained about the pain in his head. I hope it is clear that although Kavaran and his fellow spiritualists were gathering evidence and witnessing some extraordinary effects, Indridi was having a very tough time. 
He had been dragged across the floor, thrown up to the ceiling, dropped on the floor, had his head banged, and had had to endure pain so bad that after the seances, he said he felt as if he had been beaten up. Indreedy gained nothing from these experiences, as he was in a trance, and indeed one begins to suspect the motives of Kavaran with his fervent wish to promote his religion. Kavaran and Nielsen both followed spiritualism, the belief that when a person dies, he or she may have an afterlife. In other words, there is an existence beyond the physical body of humans, even after death. They also believe that these afterlife beings are able to communicate with living people. But a kind man, a spiritual man, would not have put a simple 22-year-old country boy through this much pain and used him like a laboratory rabbit. And as we will see later, it gets much worse and may indeed prove the opposite of what Kavaran wanted. If there are afterlife beings, the ones who attempt to communicate with us at this level should be avoided at all cost. The Death of Indreedy After a visit by Indreedy to the Westman Islands, he was plagued by poltergeist and levitation phenomenon that he and his controls attributed to a man named John. According to Heralda Nielsen's account to the Second International Congress for Psychical Research, John was thought to be a recent suicide. Members of the society had to spend the night in Indridi's room. He was so frightened. Plofta R. Gisurasen and Elendo Haraldsson the Icelandic physical medium Indridi Indridason. Indridi visited a clergyman living in a village in the Westman Islands off the southern coast of Iceland. While he was out walking with the clergyman's daughters, he twice reported seeing an apparition, a man in his shirt sleeves with a belt around his waist. The man had committed suicide by drowning himself in the sea, but before doing so had taken off his coat and waistcoat, which were found on the shore. After the medium's return to Reykjavik, strange disturbances started in the rooms the medium shared with the theology student. The light was turned off in their rooms in the middle of the night, and Indridi said he saw the man in the shirt sleeves whom he had seen in the village. But despite offering prayers for this person, Nielsen reported, after this, we got levitation phenomena on a larger scale than we had ever had before. And harmonium time after time was taken away from the organist while he was playing it. Sometimes it was jogged along while at the same time, the keys were touched or played upon by an invisible force. A plate standing on a bookshelf in the front room was thrown onto the floor to land inside the bedroom. Indridi's bed was pulled about one foot away from the wall. Indridi was terror-stricken and society members had to stay with him at night for some time. All regular sittings were stopped. Starting in spring 1906, Indridi complained that he did not like the experiments, and in fact never had, as he felt drained and tired as a result of them. He started to sleep badly, complained about headaches, and became depressed. He experienced a sudden serious illness in February the next year. In summer 1909, he visited his parents, and he and his fiancée, Hjörna Hudnadottir, caught typhoid fever. She died. Indridi never fully recovered, 
and did not participate in any further research. Indridi died of tuberculosis in the Vufils Stadia Sanatorium on August 31, 1912. He was just 28 years old.